Welcome, everybody. How are you? Well, today's topic is kind of a hard topic. And uh, it's about um, the biggest tree in the world. You know what that is? The tree of sin. The tree of sin. We're going to talk about sin tonight. And uh, I know that's a topic we don't like to discuss, but we need to understand about sin. You know, actually, uh, we call the, the New Testament the gospel. You know what gospel means? It means the good news. Well, uh, also, there's a lot of bad news in the gospel, too. <laughs> there's a lot of bad news. And uh, some of the bad news, the, the good news is there's a solution. But some of the bad news in the good news is well, Psalms tells us, and also Paul repeats in uh, Romans, um, the third, third chapter, 10th verse, as it is written in Psalms, there is no one righteous, not even one. Paul says that um, we have all sinned. We have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Well, that's the bad news. <clears throat> that we're all sinners. And that we all fall short of the glory of God. None are righteous, not even one. Now, if that was the conclusion of this program, then uh, this program would be a very depressing program, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, we have to understand our sin before we can deal with it. And that's the good news, that we can deal with our sin. So um, we want to talk about sin tonight. And uh, the best place to start is the origin of sin, the original sin. This concept that we're all born with original sin. I had the hardest time to understand that, didn't you? You look at a newborn baby, you look at that baby and you wonder, how in the world could this baby have sin? What in the world did this baby do? Can you imagine? You look at a newborn baby, but as soon as that baby is born, it's born in sin. How can we understand this uh, concept of original sin? What in the world could a baby do in the womb that would be sinful? What was he doing in there, smoking and drinking? In the womb? How could he do that? What did he do? <laughs> and, um, well, this is a misconception. Uh, the baby didn't commit original sin. None of us committed the original sin. We have inherited the original sin. Where did the original sin come from? I hope you've been with us several weeks because we studied the, uh, the original sin. What was the original sin? We learn that the original sin came from mankind's first ancestors, the root of our lineage. And the Bible calls these individuals Adam and Eve. So the original sin comes from the origin of man's lineage. And uh, these two individuals, Adam and Eve, God gave them, a, um, well, first he gave them an ideal. He said, become fruitful. This means become a tree of life, which means become perfect. Become one with me. Establish the true relationship between God and man. And then next, multiply. Multiply. And multiply this goodness. So Adam and Eve should have been perfect and then multiplied this perfection that ultimately then would expand to a wonderful world or an ideal world or the kingdom of heaven on earth. And he gave them a responsibility to accomplish this. And he gave them a commandment. He said, don't eat of the fruit. Now we studied what the fruit is. 
basically the fruit is um, that they shouldn't have eaten was the misuse of love. Don't misuse love. In other words, before you uh, love each other, before you multiply, you have to be fruitful. So we could say there's a prerequisite, even in the Garden of Eden, before marriage. There's a prerequisite that had to be fulfilled before Adam and Eve could have a God-centered, qualified, God-approved, God-sanctioned marriage. And what was that? To complete their growth, to become fruitful. So fruitfulness or individual perfection is the prerequisite to marriage, even in the Garden of Eden. And this is so that when husband and wife would come together in holy matrimony, then their lineage would be uh, the lineage of who? God would be God's lineage. And so if God's lineage could multiply, then we would see ultimately the expansion of the kingdom of heaven. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve didn't complete their growth. They went the way of multiplication before they went the way of fruitfulness. How do we know? Well, you can either study the divine principle or you can open the window and look at the world. It's obvious that Adam and Eve multiplied, isn't it? We, the evidence is there, isn't it? That Adam and Eve made a lineage that multiplied. But what isn't there is a multiplication of goodness or fruitfulness. We don't see the kingdom of heaven. So we can assume that Adam and Eve multiplied without God's permission. They sinned. They sinned. <laughs> so this has created then a barrier. Let's try to understand this barrier. This means that Adam and Eve essentially became parents, began a lineage in sin. In other words, without God's qualification. They had not fulfilled the prerequisite. So they were not qualified to be parents, were they? So therefore, what about their children? Could their children really be qualified to be children? If the parents are not qualified, then the children can't be qualified to really be God's children. So Adam and Eve had children who weren't qualified really to be God's children. Therefore, no one could become a true parent. The, uh, the children of Adam and Eve could not go beyond this barrier. This barrier. This barrier is the point from which they fell. They were growing towards this ideal, and we say that they were about two-thirds of the way there when they fell. So they departed from God's way about two-thirds of the way, almost there, but not quite. So from the point from which they fell to the point where they fell, then has become a prison, has become a prison. So therefore, they were not qualified to be parents. They were not qualified to start a lineage. Therefore, the children of Adam and Eve, they could, couldn't go beyond this point. No matter what they did, no matter how good they were, no matter how much they prayed, no matter how much they fasted, no one could escape this, this uh, area. All those born of this lineage could not be qualified. Uh, the children of Adam and Eve were not qualified to be born even. And they grow up, can it be possible for them to be true, qualified parents? It's impossible. Therefore, they did grow up and they, they multiplied, but what about their children? They couldn't be qualified either. And unqualified children cannot be qualified to be parents. And on and on and on and on. This cycle from parents to child, parents to child, parents to child. And going through history, and then ultimately to our own birth. Then what about us? Is it any different? So original sin means we're born without qualification. We're born without, really without qualification. That's why Paul said none is righteous, not even one. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the, and the problem is our ancestors. 
We've all got bad ancestors. We're struggling with our ancestors. And that is why, as we talked about last week, ultimately salvation means rebirth. Coming out of this lineage and grafting on to a new lineage. We need a new ancestor. A new ancestor. That's why man needs a Messiah. Ultimately, to solve this problem of the passing on of original sin from parents to child, man needs a different ancestor. And so uh, that's the Messiah. That's why the uh, Bible says that uh, Jesus came as the next Adam. That's why he said, before Abraham was, I am. Because he took the role of not a fallen ancestor like Adam was, but a good ancestor, a true ancestor. So ultimately, overcoming this original sin, man needs the Messiah to relate to the Messiah. So uh, again, uh, original sin comes to us not because we did it, but we inherited it through our, our lineage, through our lineage. So no matter what you do, you can't get rid of it. You can pray from now until your death, and it's still in there. You can fast. I could fast until I turned into a chopstick. Maybe my wife would like that. Could, I could stand to use, lose a little weight, right? <laughs> but I could fast until I, I uh, uh, began to look like, uh, uh, you know, like a chopstick. Still, that original sin is there. You can do many mighty works, can't get rid of it. There's only one way to get rid of it. Got to change your lineage change your lineage and so to do that we need the Messiah as our true ancestor well there's another kind of sin and this is hereditary sin so we, we look at original sin like the root it's the root of sin and hereditary sin is like the trunk what is hereditary sin this is the sin of our ancestors our immediate ancestors Adam and Eve are our first ancestor, our common ancestor, but uh, we also have immediate ancestors. Uh, you know, your great-great-uncles and great-great-grandparents, your immediate uh, ancestral lineage. Uh, we are affected by what our ancestors did. And there's a lot of evidence to support this. For instance, um, if you examine the ancestors of people who are criminals, you'll find nine times out of ten their ancestors were criminals. Or uh, if you look, um, if somebody uh, who is abusing their children, if you uh, examine their ancestry, usually they were people who were abused themselves. So there is an inheritance of sin through our immediate ancestry. And there's a shared responsibility. Uh, if your ancestors uh, committed sins, then the descendants have to share that responsibility. There's so much evidence to support that. Haven't you noticed that there, sometimes you'll read about a family that has so much suffering come to them? So many tragedies, so many accidents, so many of the family members die in a tragic or die uh, young. This is an indication of ancestral sin that is inherited through the lineage. This is another kind of sin that we have to deal with and take responsibility for. Uh, in a lesser degree, it's similar to original sin. Original sin, the root, hereditary sin is the trunk. How about collective sin? Collective sin is like the branches. And this is the sin of a group or a group of people, or uh, a certain uh, nation. For instance, there's a, such a thing as a national sin. And maybe, uh, and if you're a part of that nation, maybe you didn't participate in that national sin, but you suffer because of it. And I think uh, a very clear example is uh, the United States. In the beginning, God created this nation to really be a Christian nation, a God-centered nation. But when they uh, made the Constitution, they made it a little bit hazy in terms of allowing slavery. So they allowed slavery in the beginning, in the history of America. 
And because of this national sin, for, for America to allow slavery was a national sin, then the nation had to take responsibility for this collective sin or national sin. And um, the way that sin was uh, dealt with was the Civil War. The nation was divided, and the nation, everyone, suffered uh, for a four-year period uh, because collectively we had to take responsibility for this collective sin. There are many examples in history. For instance, uh, because mankind didn't receive Jesus 2,000 years ago, then what is the history of Christianity? Uh, for instance, Christianity in Rome. What happened to Christians in Rome? They really suffered. They were fed to the lines. They had to go through incredible persecution and suffering because they had to take responsibility representing mankind for the collective sin of not receiving the Messiah when he came 2,000 years ago. So there are many examples of uh, a collective sin. Also, this is one we're very familiar with, unfortunately, and that's personal sin. Then we as individuals, we commit sin. What would uh, a good definition of sin be? Personal sin. Sin is any thought or action that violates God's principle that makes a base for Satan to relate to me. In other words, when you commit a personal sin, when you sin, you become more like the master of sin. That's why he tempts us to do sin, because he wants us to be like him. And the more we become like him, the more he can relate to us. But we don't want that kind of relationship, do we? What's another way that we could uh, define sin? Simple, a general uh, way to uh, decide if you're sinning or not is sacrificing others for the sake of myself. When you're doing that, you can guarantee that you're sinning. You're sinning. Sacrificing others for the sake of myself. When I do things out of self-interest, when I do things out of uh, self-glorification, don't we sometimes like to do things to glorify ourselves? It's sin. When we do things out of uh, uh, the desire for self-gratification, when we do things out of a desire to self-justify ourselves, usually we can be sure, be guaranteed that these things are sin. So, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and say, what are sins? Well, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do, do this, don't do that. These are the sins that you can and cannot do. <clears throat> it's not that simple. So much of sin involves your motivation. What's your motivation? For instance, I've met a lot of alcoholics, a lot of drunks that told me, Jesus drank. <laughs> right? Haven't you seen that? He drank wine. So it's okay, I can drink, right? But don't you think uh, there's a difference in motivation between the, the drunk and Jesus drinking wine in the Last Supper? Don't you think there's a difference in motivation? This is the subtle area of sin, personal sin, to really, to really dig out our own motivation. What is it? Sacrificing others for the sake of myself. This is really the fertile ground for, for sin. So uh, we want to change our direction. And if we can think of others, if we can change the direction of sin, in other words, if we can instead sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others, then we can be assured that we're making a fertile ground to really come closer to God. So um, these four major areas of sin we need to know. But ultimately, as we mentioned, the solution to sin, the final solution is got to change our lineage. Got to come out of the bad lineage and come into the good lineage. And in order to do that, we have to meet a new ancestor. That's the Messiah. Thank you very much, and God bless you. highlights 
from Reverend McCarthy's lecture on types of sin. First, original sin. Second, hereditary sin. Third, collective sin. And fourth, personal sin. Frequently, there is a kind of um, false optimism which does not take seriously enough the fundamental derangement of um, human society and human being that goes back into the roots of our common human history, all of that being symbolized in the doctrine of the fall and the seriousness with which the unification tradition takes this symbol of the fall um, to me is um, very valid and very important. The way in which more particularly the um, various aspects of human deviance from God's will are reflected in unification teaching um, is unusually comprehensive, it seems to me. Also, the way in which human responsibility for the fall and for the human plight is conjoined with a significant use of the symbol of demonic forces or satanic forces which transcend the human and responsibility for the deviation from God's will uh, imputed to both of those agencies, both um, pre-human or transhuman satanic agency on the one hand and also to human agency on the other. All of this seems to me to be um, uh, on the right track. The, the qualification to be able to love God, first of all, in order to win that qualification, you must become a person that was born of God. That's number one. You have to be a born of God. I don't tell the and born as his child, God the child, so that you are the extension of God's own lineage. That's the first quality. No money about you and no money about you. No money about you. No money about you. No money Love really does not take too much explanation. Suppose your father and mother that gave you a birth. You're born of your parents. All right. So, do they have to know the manual, how to love his own child, and how to love my son and daughters, how to change the diapers? Does it need that great little manual to do that? No. Already, already parents love child. Simply because the child is an extension of himself, is the direct lineage of the parent. <laughs> So you are qualified to be loved by parents because you are direct blood line, the lineage of the parent, by the same token. In order to be able to be able to love God and be loved by God, you must become God's own lineage. <laughs> We must be born of God and in God's love. I was born and received life. And life that comes from God as a gift. And also we inherited, we received the capability of loving God as God loved us. In other words, we received that capability of love. So we, also third, we inherited the right to live or sustain uh, our life in joy as much as God wants to live. You know, by, by the same token, we inherited that right to live on in the manner that God lived on. So then, the life, for whom that life was given? For whom that love 
life and a way of life for whom that way of life should be extended. For whom all those inheritances were given. So for whom were you born? That's the simple question. For whom were you born? For, for yourself, right? For whom? Then were you born? So the very, the very best answer that for what purpose I was born, there was a reason that I was created. And that God has that reason. So you didn't have that reason, so can, you cannot be born for yourself. God has a reason, so in order to fulfill God's idea, you are born. Now, for God, you are born. To, to be more simplistic, to love God, or to be loved God, you are born. I guess it's too far. That's the way, the, the, that's the very reason you are born and created. I was not born for myself. I was born for the love of God as a fulfillment of love of God, as a fruit of love of God. <laughs> Welcome everybody. How are you tonight? Tonight we're going to talk about predestination. Predestination. And uh, there's a certain idea going around, a certain belief that's been around for many hundreds of years that everything that happens is the will of God. That God is in complete control because he's almighty. And therefore, every event that takes place, takes place as a result of God's hand and God's will. Now, the most direct result of this kind of belief is that God is getting blamed for a lot of things that are not his own doing. So we want to take a look at this idea of predestination. And is it true that everything happens is God's will? And uh, when people believe that, then they begin to wonder, well, God, why don't you do something about this world? Have you ever wondered that? God uh, used to work miracles in the Bible, in the Old uh, Testament, New Testament era. But it seems like God doesn't do anything anymore. We don't see any miracles or burning bushes or anything like that. <laughs> well, actually, um, we need to really consider this idea of predestination and try to understand it. Because, actually, we're going to find out that actually everything that happens isn't necessarily the will of God. Where does the idea come from? Well, there are a couple of Bible verses. Uh, let's look at Romans. 8.30, chapter 8, verse 30. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, Moreover, whom he did predestine, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he glorified. So it seems to be that God is in control. Everything that happens is in his hands. 
and uh, there's nothing that we can really do about it. And also, uh, if we look at the ninth chapter, the 14th verse, what shall we say then, Paul says? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. So in other words, uh, in the 18th verse, it says he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And that's it. So it doesn't depend on your effort or the exertion of your will. But it depends on whom God chooses. It's already determined. It's already predestined. God knows everything. He does everything. He's in control. Everything that happens is God's will. And if that's true, then you might as well just sit back and say, well, it's already been decided. God can look in this room and he knows who's going to heaven and who's going down. He already knows. It's already been determined. Well, the result of this belief is people sort of lose motivation in terms of living a spiritual life. Well, the Word says it. doesn't matter about my will or the exertion of my uh, will or my effort. It's all God's decided. It. But actually, uh, we have to take another look because the Scripture shows us that uh, actually God's a little bit different than that. God isn't a do-it-all-for-you God. We sort of like that, don't we? We wish God was a do-it-all-for-you God. doesn't matter what I do. It's all in God's hands. You know, we, that would be easy, right? Well, God's already determined it. And it uh, doesn't matter what I do. It's uh, all in God's hands. And I'm just here and just doing the best I can. But the other day I was reading in the Bible. The... Uh, <clears throat> Ninth chapter of Mark. And I read something that was really interesting that really struck me. I read through this, and then something caught my attention. It's a very simple question. But the implication of this question is very great. And what it is, is in the uh, 21st verse of the ninth chapter of Mark, Jesus Christ asked a question. Now this just, according to the understanding of predestination, that God knows everything he knows and he, you don't, he doesn't have to ask any questions and he knows what you're thinking, he knows what you're going to do. Well, this really defies that. And this is um, the story of a, one child that was possessed with a demon. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Now a lot of people who believed in predestination would answer, well, you're the Lord, don't you know? But the, uh, the father, he answered Jesus, he said, from childhood. And Jesus didn't say, that's correct. <laughs> he said, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, I think our concept of Almighty is a little bit wrong. What really makes God Almighty? Our, our concept of Almighty is really uh, like very intellectual. God knows everything. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to do. He knows if you're going to be uh, good or bad. He knows if you're going to obey Him and all this. Well, that's kind of an intellectual understanding of God's almighty power. Actually, the real manifestation of God's almighty power is he chooses not to know what you're going to do. But instead, he chooses to trust that you will do the right thing. That's much higher manifestation of almighty character, don't you think? I'm sure uh, God has the power to look into the future and maybe see the future. But in fact, God doesn't know what you're going to do. <laughs> and this is because God has chosen to relate to us by heart, by love. 
Remember, Genesis tells us that God created us in his image. In his image. That means he made us just like him. And because we're just like him, that means we're his children. So we have to understand, why did God create men? Why did God create children? Just for the sake of entertainment? Not at all. God created man and woman, his children, for the purpose of love. God wants a love relationship with his sons and daughters. So one thing that you'll learn very quickly about love is that the basis of love is trust. The basis of love is trust. So the relationship between God and man is hinges upon trust. Trust. There has to be trust. Uh, if you're uh, married or uh, engaged, <coughs> one thing you better learn quick is you've got to trust each other. Haven't you seen relationships where they don't trust each other? The wife goes out and the husband wants to know, where are you going? Who you been with? What are you doing? There's no trust. And why isn't there trust? Because we're afraid to get hurt, right? But the irony is when we remove trust, we almost create the very situation that causes us to be hurt. Without trust, there is no love. What if uh, every time my wife went out, I uh, hired five security guards <laughs> to watch her? Well, what kind of love relationship could develop in that kind of environment? None at all. So God doesn't scope out the future to see what you're going to do, to see whether or not he can trust you or not. God trusts. God initiates trust. And that's the beginning of our relationship with God. Now, there's something that comes with trust, a very important thing. And you know what that is? Responsibility. When someone trusts you, they also give you a responsibility, don't they? And that is that you will be true to this trust. Let's look at the real God. The Bible reveals the real God. In Genesis 6:6, 6, 6, God repented in his heart and was extremely sorrowful that he had made man on earth. Now think about that. God repented. God was sorrowful in his heart. How could it be this God that's the, supposed to scope out the future and know everything that's going to happen? I've talked to people that even believe that even before God created, he knew Adam and Eve were going to fall. He knew they were going to disobey him. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> because uh, if God could see that Adam and Eve were going to disobey, well, then he wouldn't even create it. He trusted them. He trusted them. He said, don't disobey me. Don't eat the fruit. He commanded them, and he trusted that they would obey his will. So actually, when they didn't live up to his will, he was brokenhearted. Brokenhearted. Because he had an expectation that they would live up to his trust. Also, we can see uh, in um, 1 Samuel 15:11. God repented in his heart that he had made Saul king because Saul didn't do what God asked him to do. So we can see here that actually this is really the way that God relates to man, through trust. He doesn't know what you're going to do. I don't know if he could know or not. One thing I know is he doesn't look. He trusts. He trusts. He believes in us. And as a result of that belief, then we have a responsibility. Man is created then as a responsible being. God has placed in our hands a responsibility. And you know what that is? To trust God. <coughs> to have faith in God who is having faith in us. And we can see that in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. God gave them a commandment. He gave them a commandment. Do not eat of this poisonous fruit. On that day you will surely die. And he gave them the responsibility to have faith in that commandment. Unfortunately, 
They didn't fulfill that responsibility. And as a result, God's will was not accomplished. So here's a very interesting thing that we're seeing. Is actually God doesn't have total control uh, over the accomplishment of his will. If he did, the kingdom of heaven would have been here a long time ago. Next time uh, you look at this world and you get angry at God and say, why don't you do something about this world? Then God will answer you and say, if I was in total control, this world would never have been like this. We have to now be awakened to the fact that God's will is only accomplished when man fulfills his portion of responsibility. We say that in terms of uh, the accomplishment of God's will, which is the kingdom of heaven on earth, God does 95%. But then he gives man a 5% portion of responsibility. And this man having responsibility enables us then to have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. God trusts us, and because we have that trust, then our relationship with God can be a relationship of heart. What if God just uh, controlled us? by some uh, cosmic force. Well, that wouldn't be a love relationship, would it? You know, when you're, if you're married or if you're going to be married, you should learn that lesson really quick. Don't try to control each other with force. You know, uh, where are you going? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Or, you know, you can't go out. Stay in the house. Haven't you seen that kind of relationship? Lock the door. Close the window. <laughs> Don't you look at nobody. You just love me. Come on, love me. That person's the most difficult person to love, right? So there can only be love where there's freedom, trust, and responsibility. And God gave us this responsibility. And he won't take it away. And he's given us this responsibility to have faith in him so much that unless we do it, then his will will not be accomplished. So we can see from the very beginning that Adam and Eve lost faith in the commandment and the kingdom of heaven didn't come. And we see that 4,000 years later, Jesus came and uh, when someone asked him, what must we be doing to do the will of God? He said, believe in me. Have faith in me. Believe in him and he is faith. So faith, man had to have faith in the Messiah. How many times in the scripture can you read where Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. Now, this is a very important principle. Actually, Jesus didn't have to go to the cross to forgive sins. He could forgive sins on earth. He said the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins on earth based on what? When people would make a condition of faith. The woman who touched his robe, that your faith has made you whole. So your sins can be forgiven when you demonstrate faith in the Messiah. So faith, got to have faith. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on earth? That's what determines whether or not God's will is accomplished, whether there is faith. So when God's will will be accomplished in your life when you have faith in God. When you trust in God. So God is doing 95%. You know, God has created the heavens and the earth. God has created our spirit and our physical body. And all we got to do is put the parts together. Put the parts together. So really, in every way, as his image, as his son and daughter, we're really co-creators with God, co-creators. So when man shows faith in God, then God's will is accomplished. God can change this world when man shows faith in God. God can transform your life if you show faith in him. The problem with faith is, uh, you know, when you have faith in God, you have to be patient. God will have faith in you if, that is, if you follow my schedule. If you do things according to my time schedule, 
then I'll have faith in you. So it uh, can't be like that. We have to have faith in God and be patient. Let him work. Let him intervene in our life according to his schedule, according to his way, and accept it uh, by, uh, by faith. So um, the one thing that made Jesus marvel, the one thing that made Jesus marvel, you know what that was? Faith. The faith of the Roman centurion. Jesus marveled at this Roman centurion that had faith. And when we can relate to God in faith, then God will marvel at you. And this is the beginning of a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. So let's have faith. Let's uh, pray to God in faith. If you have troubles, if you have difficulties, if you need God's intervention in your life, don't just stand on the corner and say, why don't you come down here and do something? Understand that you've got a responsibility to have faith in him. Pray to him in faith. Ask in faith. And then you make the foundation for God to intervene in your life. And you'll see it. You'll see the intervention of God in your life. So this is the secret. We have a responsibility. And let's realize it. Thank you very much. God bless you. Here are the highlights from Reverend McCarthy's lecture on faith and responsibility. First, God created us to engage in a love relationship with Him. Second, trust is the basis of love. Third, His trust is manifested by giving us responsibility. Faithfulness is our responsibility. Fifth, God's will is accomplished only when this responsibility is fulfilled. And sixth, all events are not predestined. We have to remember, when we look at man, that God so loved man, he created him in his own image, and he sent his only son as a man to die for us. And I think this is something that, that must be emphasized. The place of God cannot be denied, for God is paramount in all of our feelings. But also what's important is realizing the process of relationship between God and man. Man has a dignity, and that dignity is so great that God descended that uh, God decided that His only Son would descend upon this earth as a man. We know God by knowing Jesus, and we know Jesus through His humanity. The whole idea of history, that thing in which humanity is involved is a process to gain restoration through our own responses to our loving God. And within this configuration, I, I see something very beautiful being said. And that has to do with the dignity of man, the intrinsic worth of the individual. And it's the idea of man and God in cooperation with one another to eventually be joined in a, in a divine paradise that's at the heart of Christianity. I think in many instances, religious people have a tendency to debilitate the idea of humanity. And there are problems in terms of secular humanism, but the spirit and idea of humanity itself is a divine thing that we can't forget. One of the things that I, I, I've seen here in the analysis of history and in the articulation of the principle as a process towards, as an understanding of the process towards restoration is the validity of this thing that I and all other human beings experience, that thing of being a human, that thing of knowing that God himself became human. This is something that can't be forgotten. 
However, that humanity cannot be the center of what we are. That humanity must center around a relationship to God. This was very succinctly and very beautifully put forward during this conference. And, and, and very clearly done, too, because I think that uh, this is what we're working with, a process that requires relationship, relationship of the human being to the divine, with God as the center of that relationship. With Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all here. You're a fine-looking group. This week, uh, we're going to talk about the Messiah. You've heard the word Messiah, haven't you? Messiah or Christ. What well, Actually, the, the meaning of the word Messiah simply means anointed, anointed one. But we need to understand more deeply the meaning of the Messiah. Why does he come? Why does the Messiah have to come? Before we can understand that man needs a Messiah, we need to understand uh, what's man's basic problem. Last week, we talked about the root of sin. We, we mentioned that God had an original plan for man that was not realized. Uh, God told Adam and Eve three things. He told them, first of all, you should be fruitful. And then, you should multiply. And then have dominion over all things. Now, what does it mean to be fruitful? We can understand what it means to multiply. God told Adam and Eve, well, get married and have a bunch of children. Have a lot of kids. Fill the, the earth. But we can see that there is a prerequisite for marriage. He didn't say multiply and then be fruitful. He said, first, you must be fruitful. And this is individual perfection. <coughs> and uh, he said, you must become fruitful. Meaning that Adam and Eve would have to achieve this state of perfection as a prerequisite to marriage. And uh, as Jesus said very clearly, we have to become a temple of God. So perfection simply means that God is dwelling in us, and we are dwelling in God. And in perfection, there is no sin possible. So therefore, when they would multiply, when they would multiply, their marriage, the marriage of Adam and Eve, would be centered on God. Centered on God. So this means that the children of Adam and Eve would be the expression of God. In every real sense of the word, they would be the children of God. And what we would see multiplying from this family would be a family and a society, ultimately a nation, and an entire world would have multiplied from this original foundation of goodness centered on God. And you know what we would call that? Jesus spoke about it. He called it the kingdom of what? God. Kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And it's very important to realize that this kingdom would not only just be a spiritual kingdom, but it would be a physical kingdom as well. It would, it would uh, exist in spirit, but also on earth. So in other words, if Adam and Eve had fulfilled this original ideal, we wouldn't see sin, we wouldn't see conflict, we wouldn't see man's inhumanity to man. As a matter of fact, we would see the most beautiful human society. The human society would be the most perfect expression of God's character. As we know, God's characteristics are expressed in the creation. When you want to get close to God, where do you go? You get away from the city, right? You get away from human beings. 
And you go up to the mountain, to the nature, where everything's beautiful and natural. Well, if we can see God in those things, how much more we should see God in the human society. That was his original intention, that the human society really be his perfect expression. So where would you find God? In the ideal, you'd find it in the city, where there was people. That's where you would find the most visible expression of God. That would be the kingdom of heaven, on earth and then inherited in spirit. Jesus said, what you sow on earth, what do you do? You reap in heaven. 